My name is Mokima Kura. I'm the Executive Director of Africa No Filter. We're a not-for-profit. We're working to shift stereotypical narratives about, but equally importantly, within Africa. And because we are learning that the world, what the world believes about Africa is what Africa believes about itself. So I'm joined in this conversation by colleagues in the media space, journalists, funders and advertisers in what I really hope will be a thought provoking discussion. So before I introduce my panel, let's unpack a few more findings from our report. The report was called How African Media Covers Africa and just a little bit of context and background to it. We made the decision to look at African media only in this report and that's because I think generally as Africans, we're usually very quick to call out global news outlets for how they cover Africa. So we decided to find out how do African outlets cover Africa. So in this report, we analyzed 300 articles from 60 media outlets um, and connected with 63 media editors in 15 countries over a two month period to compile the findings. So I'm going to hand over to Paula and the CEO and founder of Frey Media, who actually did the research through her organization. So as Moki said, we um, really kind of had a survey of, of, of editors. We uh, reviewed stories on websites and, um, and then we participated in focus groups with Africa No Filter and um, just to get a sense of how Africa is covered by Africa. And we really had three key insights um, um, and I'm going to look at them really, really quickly. So, 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 uh, and just give you a highlight of it. And firstly, we, we really kind of found that sources of news are an issue on the continent, and I'll speak more of that. The nature of the content um, um, is what we've come to expect, and it kind of really does feed the narrative, or it feeds the stereotype of what we expect. And then really the quality of journalism, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, was also an issue. Um, when we look at sources of news, 63% um, of the outlets um, um, did not actually have a correspondent on the continent. And in fact, what we found was that wire services and free content was really the primary source very often of stories about Africa in Africa media. Um, and, and, and just to be clear, that's what we were looking at. We were looking at how African media actually covered the rest of the continent um, and what kind of stories they were covering. Linked to the wire services and free content really being the primary sources, we also um, 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 found that uh, um, wire services like the BBC, Reuters um, um, and, and um, AFP really accounted for a quarter of all stories about the continent. And so, um, and that content from African news agencies um, were, were, were minimal. Um, many of the stories that we were, were published were kind of lifted from wire services or, or even if they were press releases, they were often covered verbatim. Um, and, 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 and so you could say that in many ways, stories that Africans are hearing about each other are largely dictated or being um, sourced from non-Africans, from people coming onto the continent and actually covering the continent. When it comes to the, the nature of the content, we really found an overwhelming amount of it was just hard news. And a lot of that hard news was actually um, political in nature. Um, there were very, very few features or soft news stories about the continent. Um, and, and, and so the vision we have of ourselves really is that um, 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 there, there's no, there's no nuanced coverage in terms of there's no features, very limited features, 7% human interest, 4% sort of the stories that we actually surveyed were arts and culture. And so when you look, if you drill down into the nature of, of, of the coverage, we really found that there were a lot, there were lots of politics and elections. Um, we did the survey over September, October, um, over a three week period. So it was a number of, we went back to the website a number of times. And, and, and really, there were a number of elections happening on the continent, and so we found 26% of the coverage was really um, politics and elections. We then um, um, found about 13% of, of it was conflict, um, and, at, and I should point out that at this point we had in SARS, um, which really um, um, was covered across the continent. And then another 13% of the stories that we found were economics, trade, and business. But I should say that in the economics, trade, and business stories, we really found that half of the stories were pan-African um, and featuring expert voices like the World Bank um, and the African Union. 
so when we're looking at the quality of journalism, um, we found that the stories very often lacked content, um, that voices of ordinary citizens were rarely heard or featured, and that there were few, few stories that offered a counter narrative with limited human interest. Um, so stories that Africans are getting are larger being um, produced or dictated by non-Africans. The stories offer the usual narratives with few stories that counter the narrative. There was a very little context and, and, and very, very little voices of ordinary people. Um, and editors said it was a lack of funding, a lack of advertising interest in Africa and a lack of space. And one of the quotes that really stood out for me was this, um, was, was, this was a statement that, you know, are Africans interested in Africa? Um, and so um, I do want to say that there was lots of good news too. Um, 80, um, more than 80% of the editors we spoke to did want African content and they wanted better African content. But we also found really good exemplars of nuanced, contextualized, varied stories about the continent, whether it was in the nation or the Mail and Guardian, the Daily Maverick or the Elephant in, in, in Kenya. So lots of really um, 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 good exemplars. Um, and I think that it really leads to, to huge um, opportunities for us to grow away to look for increased investment and capacity building on the continent and really look for new networks and new ways of, of telling content um, um, or, or creating content on the, um, on the continent. So I'm going to hand back to you, Moki. I want to move on to Professor Nixon Kiriti, the CEO of Tangaza African Media, which is a media research company. Um, I wanted to take us very quickly through a few insights about the sort of stories that global media outlets and international newswire services cover about the continent. Good evening. The current media coverage is the loss of opportunities that there are, you know, on, on, on where the continent is today. There are very few foreign, um, permanent, foreign permanent correspondents reporting from the continent. In actual fact, people are imported into Africa whenever there is a story and you, you, you fly in from from uh, Europe or from another, another place, come and cover the story and then you get out. So the African story does not have any sort of continuity. It's, it's covered episodically and very erratically. There's also a marginalization of African news issues, um, you know, because a lot of Western uh, countries and uh, they are so consumed with their own national issues that their news cycles just can't accommodate the African news stories. Uh, one other point that is really important in research that we found out is the minimal appreciation of, 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 and, and knowledge of the huge African progress that's been made in every aspect of human life. And, and finally, one of the things that we found out in research is, uh, is the widening gap between the last story that's been covered about Africa and what's going on in reality. So you find someone coming and saying, oh, but I mean, is there still farming? And then with the time they are saying that there's a bumper harvest, oh, is a, uh, uh, is a girl child going to school? And if you look at African universities, the scale tips in many universities that there are more, uh, more female students registered. You, you don't understand why they would never have a continuity in what they do. Looking forward, and I think it's exciting, and I think this is where we are today. Global audiences now, they have what they've been denied for centuries. They have, an, they have an access to true African stories using the, the, you know, the technology that's now available to them. And they can now get real stories, true stories about Africa told by Africans and actually through African films. I think this is a window of opportunity that, uh, that, that African oil filters is all about. Um, let me quickly introduce um, the panel because we're gonna to go to a panel discussion first. So just thanking um, Paula and Nixon for that. Um, let me just introduce the panel. First of all, we've got Vasanta Angamatu, who is the CEO of African News Agency, which is the continent's only Pan-African news and syndication service. Um, we've got Jonathan Rosenthal, who's the Africa editor at The Economist. Um, we've got Dapo Oloron Yomi, who is the publisher and editor of chief, um, editor in chief of Premium Times, which is one of the leading fearless independent media outlets in Nigeria. And he's been arrested a number of times. So I tell you, they are fearless. We've also got Agil Deng, who's a program manager at Bloomberg Media Initiative and Africa Corporate Philanthropy. She's actually also one of ANF funders. So I'm extremely happy to see her here. And our final panelist is Tebe Ikalafeng, who many of you will know um, is the CEO of Brand Leadership Group and the man behind Africa's top 100 brands. So let's start the conversation. Um, Dapo, I'm coming to you first. You've seen the findings of the report that so much international coverage is used in African outlets. You are the editor of um, Premium Times. 
does it surprise you? And how much of this is actually true to what you do on Premium Times? There are other issues, you know, all this is also related to how we're going to return great hands, uh, you know, for media who can really do this, uh, a new regime of uh, access to information in many of our countries, um, coupled with uh, a media freedom, um, also regime which is following from totally illiberal democracies that's just spread across. So it's very difficult from this very uh, complex uh, perspective to uh, disagree with the kinds of uh, important points that I think we are hearing from uh, this survey. From our own particular focus, uh, we started uh, hoping that we'll be able to cover the sub-region. Uh, we try as much as possible to do more impactful coverage of, say, Ghana. I would tend to look at where Nigerians are. Nigerians, of course, are really all across everywhere, but now we're able to do Ghana and Syria alone with some sense, hoping to grow. Are you doing English Ghana and Syria alone? Africa. Are you doing Ghana and Syria alone with correspondents? So you've got your own people there? Yes, we have. We okay. have uh, okay. our own people here. That's okay. uh, But then, of course, we then also have to augment, like every other person using agencies uh, to do the other coverage. Uh, right. So, okay. Yeah, frankly, it's yes and no, uh, but more in the direction of no than yes. Right. Okay, I'm going I'm to come back to you because I, I, I want to find out more about whether or not you understand the narrative you're feeding when you pick up these stories. But Jonathan, I want to chat to you now. Um, most people will remember the two iconic Economist covers that have literally defined the African narrative over the last decade. Um, it's The Hopeless Continent and the Africa Rising um, covers. And I think we'll just bring that up quickly. And uh, Jonathan, are you surprised at all about the influence The Economist has had in defining the African narrative? And don't you or your colleagues, or do you and your colleagues actually care? So, so I think you're right. It's, it's, it's kind of quite staggering. Forget about the world. It's quite staggering just sort of how much influence there is on the continent that you can you know, take Nigeria, you can have a hundred columnists writing articles that are that are critical of a Nigerian president. And I'm sure Dapa will, will bear me out on this. And 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 you know, in a sense, many, you know, in Nigeria, forget the rest of the world, will will sort of overlook them. But when the economist comes out with a with a big piece that is perhaps critical of a of a, of a president, it kind of you know goes viral within Nigeria. Everyone's talking about it. Um so, so, so that makes us quite humble. I mean, I, I suppose in one sense, it's normal. Uh, it, this is not just an African phenomenon. I'm, I'm sitting here in, in kind of Brexit, COVID Britain. Uh, and, and again, there'll be a hundred columns a day about how awful Brexit is. But when the New York Times writes an article that says, you know, Britain has really messed up Brexit, everyone here is talking about that. So uh, to some extent, I think it's normal that people within a country want to talk about and think about how the world sees them. So, so, so that's to be expected. Um, as to what that means for us and how we sort of think about our coverage and shape our coverage, uh, I, I think we both have to be humble and responsible. Um, you know, there is power there. I think that that power can be used for great good. There are, you know, sort of journalists in, in countries, you know, Tanzania or um, Ethiopia right now that are not free to do their work. And they they're talking to me all the time saying, you know, can't you guys have a piece on what's happening in kind of my own country? Uh, so, so, so we're aware of, of you know, the fact that we can have some positive influence there. At the same time, and I think you're right with those two covers, we need to be very careful not to just fall into kind of easy, lazy characterizations that, that, that just sort of hew to, to cliches and stereotypes. Right. Right. Thanks, Jonathan, for that. And thanks for acknowledging that it might happen in some cases. So, um, Vasanta, I, I'm going to come to you now, because in this report, um, it said that some African news agencies contributed less than 1% of the content we analysed. Now, you are the CEO of the continent's only Pan-African news agency. So why aren't media outlets rushing to pick up your content? 
Thank you, Moki. You know, that's a question I'm hoping to find answers to in discussions like this one. So thank you for inviting us to participate. At Anna, we're on a, on a continuous quest to find, you know, what we believe to be the sweet spot of content from Africa, about Africa, by Africans, for the continent and the world that shifts away from that kind of limited span of elections, corruption, poverty. And in trying to understand why we're not as successful as we would like to be uh, uh, in terms of having our content picked up, both on the continent and globally, um, we're the kind of answers we've come to mostly center around financial constraints. So most media houses have dramatically cut syndication budgets. Uh, most media houses focusing on core content that gives them like quick audience and revenue growth, local content, entertainment, lifestyle, sport. Uh, African content very often in our discussions with potential partners or clients, the kind of responses we get leads us to believe that African content is a nice to have rather than a must have. Um, it's, it's really great to read in the report, you know, when Paula presented the highlights that 87% of African editors said it was important or very important to cover African stories. And we're hoping in there lies the opportunity for us to get our content used by more publishers. You know, if I'm going to be candid, Moki, the struggle to find a market for African content is very real. And Jonathan's comments mm -hmm. just now about, um, um, you know, how when The Economist writes uh, much the same story as would have been written by uh, a Nigerian media, uh, The Economist is taken more seriously, makes us ask questions like, are we not taking ourselves seriously enough? You know, do we need to look outside for context or affirmation or thought leadership uh, from the outside before we can take our stories uh, to heart mm -hmm. and, and talk about them. You make a really good point about, you know, trusting our media, which brings me to Tebe, who, who's actually really here to talk about the money in media, which is advertising. But, um, you know, Tebe, you, you, you are the sort of Africa's top 100 brands, and you also took a look at the most popular media brands in Africa. So just take us through some of the results, which I think will speak to what you were saying, Vasanta. When you look at the brand Africa 100, Africa's best brands um, uh, a report that we should do every year, you see that 70% of the media that Africans say they admire are non-African. And we know the usual suspects are from uh, BBC being number one, CNN three, uh, ITV, uh, Netflix and Canal Plus. But what's quite interesting is um, you see in the African space, uh, the, uh, the two brands, uh, DSTV is not a media channel itself, it's a channel of channel. And then uh, MTN itself is, uh, uh, is not necessarily a medium, if you will, but it is a medium because they position themselves uh, as, as a medium as well. So that's what we see in, in that space. But reflection or comment was made earlier about um, uh, one percent of the content uh, from Africa gets into the international in, uh, into, uh, from African news agencies get into international work. But what's also interesting is that African Africa contributes only one percent to the total advertising uh, revenue of six hundred and sixty billion worldwide. So you can see that uh, even when it comes to creating. Um, uh, co content from a from a pure advertising, which is commercial, we actually are not even contributing much uh, uh, to that as well. Thanks for that, um, Tebez. Um, Magil, let me come to you, um, because one of the issues that was highlighted in the report was about the quality of local journalism. So when there were articles that were written by local journalists, um, we talked about lack of context, the fact that there were very few sort of, um, you know, ordinary voices, um, citizens in the stories. Now, Bloomberg has spent millions of dollars supporting African media. Tell me, are you winning? And is the quality of journalism, A, improving and B, capable of improving? Great. Uh, thanks so much, Moki. Um, in terms of quality of journalism improving, I think, um, one way to, to tell, you know, all indications, you know, we work with independent evaluators for all of our programs and, um, and the answer is yes in both um, short term and long term outcomes. But also we hear directly from our alumni. Um, as you know, we have more than 780 alumni across 19 countries on the continent. And then also from our, our grantees, there are 12 that have received um, funding from our grants and what they say, you know, from employers, feedback is that the writing has improved, the quality of writing has improved, but also for alumni, um, they have more opportunities, um, more career opportunities um, through their training um, and the skills they've been able to um, enhance their reporting. Um, even for our grantees, um, some of the stories they picked up at the local level in terms of accountability um, for the local leaders, a few stories in Kenya around the environment were picked up by regional national papers. So. It is, it is working, um, providing opportunities. And I just wanted to say that, you know, in 
on the continent, there is there is really no shortage of pipeline in terms of talent. And what this report highlights um, around the issues of uh, content and quality is it's about opportunity and access. And I think that's that's where um, funders have an important role to play um, in terms of providing access um, and to be complementary to um, the existing infrastructure, um, because we know that there are gifted, talented, highly skilled storytellers, reporters, editors, African news agencies, but without the access to training, to enhance skills, um, you know, access to funding for the community media, access to technology, um, to improve content distribution, there won't be an opportunity for having more nuanced stories from across the continent out there more widely. So, so again, I'm just going to press you on this a bit. You know, does that mean that literally Bloomberg is going to have to continue doing this forever? If you were to pull the funds and not be here, you know, what happens to us? So I don't think that Bloomberg or um, any funder or donor has to be here forever. And I think for our approach, it's unique. I probably should take a back step. Much like Africa No Filter, at the beginning, we also did research um, and spoke with editors, um, um, academics, um, journalists to design the Bloomberg Media Initiative Africa program. And it really is around enhancing capacity, um, increasing access to information, mm -hmm. um, providing educational offerings and offer also an opportunity for media owners and operators to, to convene. And so all of the interventions are addressing gaps within the existing infrastructure. It's not meant to replace anything. Um, even for a community radio um, and media grantees, they're always been sustainable. They've been, you know, the voice of the anti-apartheid struggle or NSARS. And so the interventions are really meant to enhance and complement what's out there and, and help them elevate and amplify their voices. It's not meant to, to operate in a, in a silo. Right. So, so media owners shouldn't be looking at philanthropic funders as a, an alternative source of revenue to the diminishing advertising return, then it sounds like. But, you know, good point. I'm going to come back to you, um, Dako, because this is a sentence that a couple of people have said, including Paula and Vasanta, you rec um, mentioned it. Do you think that Africans are interested in Africa? Oh, I think tremendously. Uh, there's a great test for this. I mean, we hear this from a lot of our readers. Uh, people write comments and make references. They want to know what's happening in places in South Africa. Um, if you have a country like Nigeria, which is very outfunded the diaspora, you know, things are happening in South Africa, they want to know. Uh, they also want to know about success stories. Uh, and one thing that we keep hearing very often now is the whole question of youth life. We want to know what young people are doing here, how are they overcoming these kinds of difficulties, what are the paths to success and things like that. I think there's a huge test for this. Um, so which makes it all the more uh, sad and uh, shameful that we are able to meet this kinds of uh, demand. And, yeah. um, no, I'll, I'll tell you, um, that I mean, it's a good point you make, but one of the editors in one of the focus groups um, is an editor of a national newspaper in South Africa. She said that she has no coverage on any other African country because her readers are not interested. I'll just leave that there. So I think there's some editors mm -hmm. who are either laboring under the belief that they don't need to do it. Um, but yeah, thanks for that. And one thing I do think is missing from this conversation is a youth perspective. And I want to know what are the young people actually reading or what are they listening to? I mean, are they informed about African affairs? And if they are, where are they getting their news from? Um, and you know, you can't just say, oh, they're getting it on Instagram. They get, but who? Which, which counts are they following? So I got Tomiwa Aladekomo, who's the CEO of Zikoka Media. It's an online content provider. And they're targeting young Nigerians with content that you know, basically makes them laugh. Um, and between Facebook and Instagram, they've got something like 5 million followers. Um, Tomiwa, are you there? Um, can you tell me, do yeah. young people actually care about any of this? Um, and what media, what actual media are they consuming as opposed to media platforms? Hi, uh, thanks for having me, Moki. Um, I should be clear, we, across all our platforms, web and social, we reach about 6 million people monthly, um, just to clarify that. But um, yes, I think young people are, they pay attention to media at, about the continent in an interesting way. You're right, the platforms are the kind of point of entry, but frequently they're consuming foreign media platforms. And I think that's why it's all the more important for us to develop platforms that speak to young people 
about contemporary issues in a way that they are willing to engage with. And so Zikoko will do content about Africa or Tech Cabal, our technology publication, will do content about the continent, but young people connect with it because it is playful, it's gift driven, it speaks in the vernacular that they understand, it speaks to the issues that they care about. Um, but to be blunt, I mean, their primary sources of income, uh, of, I said of income, the primary sources of news are still big foreign sort of platforms. They're still following, you know, whether it's announcements for the New York Times or The Economist, or those are the things that are really shaping their perspectives of the continent. And until we have much stronger, more vibrant sort of new media platforms that speak to these audiences in uh, language and context that makes sense to them, it's very difficult to, um, to drive a new African narrative, basically. Yeah. Let me just quickly ask you, because you did this thing called Jollof Tours, where you went through um, yeah. West Africa. Just very quickly tell us, you know, you were going through different countries. Did people enjoy that? Oh. Were your viewers really Fantastic. interested in other countries? So we did a project called Jollof Road, where we had uh, five people travel across West Africa, 14 countries over 80 days in a bus. And we filmed the content uh, from that. We wrote daily journals. And we had people from all of those countries following us along this trip. Um, it's been, it was a really fantastic way to tell a story that would ordinarily be told by a foreign outlet. So if you think about documentary content, uh, content about the continent, it's always, you know, an Australian, American coming in here, you have, you know, sort of uh, this external gaze on the continent. And so what was great about it was to have five young people, you know, in their 20s, their 30s, telling you what life on the continent is like, engaging with people, with their peers and with people like them or with people that they had some background and understanding of. And as a storytelling model, we thought it was incredibly powerful. And it's something that is an opportunity for us to talk about ourselves and to talk to ourselves in a way that we don't do enough. Right, okay, no, thanks, um, Tomiwa. Thanks for, yeah. for joining. Um, Jonathan, let me come to you. Um, because we, we've talked a little bit about, about what, um, you know, global outlets or what the kind of content we see in African outlets. And it's really been, you know, very event driven. So it's the NSARS, it's the Tigray um, um, issue in, um, in Ethiopia. Tell me, when you look at what your stories are or what stories you're gonna put in um, to The Economist, is there a particular type of story that you tend to go for? Or is it that you know that this one will get accepted because it's news or what? What is the sort of thinking behind what goes into the, the stories that appear in the in the economist yeah so, so so that's i mean that's that's probably the toughest question of all because you've got so many countries uh with so many things happening some some sorts of events you know uh, the, the research talks about elections kind of bubbling up with with so many countries there are going to be elections some of those elections are contested you kind of sort of can't ignore what's happening and you know what's just happened in Uganda for instance um, so you do end up with those sorts of stories uh, at the same time you know a huge uh, effort that we make is to try to say kind of just like, sort of what are the normal uh, and again this is without a kind of Africa rising Africa hopeless kind of any kind of filter uh, is just to say what are the kind of normal things that we would be reporting about you know very boring countries. You know, I did a stint in Germany. The Economist writes about pension reform in Germany. I'm kind of saying, like, you know, to my correspondents, I want stories about kind of the pension system, you know, in, in Nigeria or Kenya or South Africa. Let's talk about that kind of like slow, boring news that is important, but that isn't normally bubbling up. Right. And are your correspondents going out of their way to find those, you know, normal stories? Or do you find that actually your big, big editor up top, you know, in, in London, wants the kind of war story, the conflict political election story. Is, is it a constant battle between what they want, and what, you know, you want? So, so, so I think, look, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I mean, the, 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 you know, the Economist is a kind of, a, a, on the geeky end of publications. Uh, and, and my boss, you know, the, the editor in chief loves geeky stories. So that makes life easy. But you know, speaking for the, the media more generally, you know, kind of there is a bit of a joke among kind of my contemporaries in the big British dailies that, you know, kind of, you know, if someone rings up and says, I've got an interesting story in Kenya, the desk editor in 
in, in, in London will say, you know, does it involve a lion eating a Brit and ideally is the Brit, you know, kind of a royal? Um, and if you can kind of say yes, yes, and yes, kind of they'll give you space. If you're kind of saying, I want to do Kenyan, you know, pension reform or the Kenyan budget or that sort of thing, it's a no. Okay, good to know. How does um, African news agency kind of prioritize alternative stories? Because we're hoping that you, your agency is not delivering the same things that Reuters and all the others are. Are you going out of your way to find other stories? And just tell us about some of those kind of stories. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Moki. So, you know, the content that does well um, with uh, international clients are the familiar ones, you know, elections, strife, corruption, lack of development, and occasionally a quirky story. And the stories that we're particularly proud of, because the team, the, the, the newsroom that we have, uh, um, goes out of its way to hunt down these these stories, you know, stories of African innovation, achievement, Africans doing well in the world. We're very big at looking at African successes around the globe, whether it is um, Marcus Samuelson as a chef in, in Harlem or a designer who's doing well in, in, in Europe. And we, we believe the stories would do really well, but they don't. But that said, IOL, which is South Africa's second largest website and one of our key partners, um, has just shared with me some stats that show the stories that have actually done well. So their top eight stories over the past two months include, for example, um, um, sorry, the stories that do well include stories of cross-border movement and migration, wealth, people, and discoveries, and not the stories of elections or strife or corruption or development or lack of development. No, thanks for that. I did want to make a quick comment um, on, the, on, on what uh, Vasanta and Nagil said, or rather the underlying uh, issue that I see uh, from both from both their comments. And, 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 and the, the, the one part of it is that there's a lot of uh, uh, dependence on Africans for everybody else to cover their stories well. Uh, what we need to do as Africans is, uh, Professor uh, Chinua Achebe said, until we learn how to tell our own story, our, our tales of the hunter will always be glorified. So we need to own our channels. We need to invest in our channels and tell our stories our own way. The same way that we, uh, as, as Dapo said, the same as, as, as we uh, uh, refer to other people's channels or the, the global channels or CNN, BBC uh, for quality journalism, we want them to refer to us as well. But they never going to do that until we have the same quality uh, quality uh, uh, comment content. And what I give said as well about um, about Bloomberg training or the CNN journalists of African journalists of the year or BBC, in my view is, I actually worry whether we should be accepting such kind of investments because chances are, uh, all, everybody will be self-centered as, as, a, as, a, as a channel. They will be training us to tell stories uh, from perspective because certainly right. they're not teaching us how to write how to, to write but it well, was well, how to filter the story and, and to me that is my that is my, my my worry and i'm not a journalist but i've been around right. but it's a point it, it's a point of view so Agil, i'm going to actually ask you to to address that point of view and right. um, what teva yeah. is saying well you heard it yeah i did and and i would i would counter that i mean i think for our approach we obviously specifically focus on business and financial journalism that's the type of news that we do and, and it's a systemic approach. So you look at the pipeline level. And if you even look at our bureaus, all of the bureaus, all five across the continent are run by Africans. And so it is an African story. These are African trained journalists from African institutions. We also do capacity building and interventions with universities. So business schools and journalism schools have business and finance curriculums that we support. It's taught by their faculty, written by their faculty. It's truly an African program, just with additional support. Um, and, this, and the same thing applies. So if you are an editor in Nigeria, from Nigeria, and the NSARS is happening, but you happen to be working for an international news organization, you bring a perspective that nobody else can because you have that lived experience, plus you were trained at home. We also work, you know, convening government leaders, business owners, and media operators in terms of how to support the business and broader journalism ecosystem, and then down to the community level, which really Ford Foundation helped us support. Um, as everybody knows, radio is the biggest um, medium in Africa, and you can't have media without community media on the continent, and that's where most people get their news. I mean, we're sitting in the big cities right now, but we see this very clearly during Ebola, as you just mentioned, but also now during COVID and support to those organizations that are already doing things, but enhancing the tools and enhancing their opportunities to have access in a broader platform is critical, but it's still an African story if it's 
told and written by and edited by Africans. Um, I, I think you make a quick point. I just want to quickly say that we have had, you know, people say to us, and I have heard journalists say that even though if they're African and they work for a global news outlet, their stories are framed or written in a way that is acceptable to that outlet. So oh, I, I, think, I think there, there are, you know, it's, it's not one way or the other. And I do think there are people we've spoken to who say that. But, you know, having said that, you know, Agil, it's not your, your, your fault. I'm going to ask this one from Nic Nic Nicole Lopez. To what degree do you think African media struggles from a language diversity problem? And she says she can speak <laughs> from her own experience that the most commonly read newspaper in her language is a tabloid. And, and most other media outlets are in English. And my community does not primarily speak English. Um, so the question is, so maybe I should um, put that to, to um, Dapo. To what do you agree do you think African media struggles from a language diversity problem? Because, you know, not everybody speaks the major language like English or French or, or Portuguese. That, that's true. I, I think the language is certainly an issue. I'll just give you an illustration. So we have a facts uh, checking platform and we were actually trying to do uh, the whole of the West African, but they don't have to deal with French. We have to deal with Portuguese uh, speaking. And that's really a big challenge. And even when we want to develop partnership, as that's how we get a lot of content also, it's difficult for us to be able to absorb content, like say from places like Guinea-Bissau, because this is Portuguese speaking. Uh, so that's really uh, a, a great challenge, I would say. However, within national uh, framework, um, you, you see that uh, indigenous language uh, media really is able to pull through a massive, massive uh, uh, audience. And this is a right. kind of bandwidth that I think international uh, broadcasters uh, like Tick House and things like that, 70 right. million potential listeners they're able to uh, sweep the cream in this regard. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, thanks for that. I'm gonna take one um, quick question from Mpindi Abbas, who's in Uganda. And he says, I work with young journalists. How do you change our university curriculum to prepare young journalists to challenge the negative narratives? Um, but um, maybe I can ask either um, Vasanta or um, Agil um, about who wants to take that question. So um, if I may, Moki, um, one of the things that we find with the journalists that we work in in the Anna newsroom is that that interest in, in Africa in terms of the history, being able to set context, one of the things that came out very clearly in your report is the need for nuanced context textual reporting if we are going to respond to you know Tebe has shared my favorite quote about uh, the, the the lion uh, uh, learning to write the tale will always be told by the hunter it, it's become a kind of mantra and so we have found that even if a, the curriculum prepares or journalism schools and the and the curriculum prepares young journalists to be multimedia journalists they equip them with all the the right skills but there isn't anything in that curriculum that looks at uh, the singular narrative about Africa globally it doesn't look at, for example, you know, uh, uh, when uh, Chinua Achebe writes in um, Africa's tarnished name that that profound perception of alienness that Africa has come to represent for Europe, you know, and Britain and the U.S. is not the uh, not the result of ignorance. It's by design. It was a deliberate invention to facilitate two very shameful historical travesties, being the Atlantic slave trade and the colonization of Africa. So. In, in, young journalists, when they're being prepared to enter newsrooms, and of course that becomes harder and harder as our newsrooms uh, shrink, um, don't come with that context. So what we what we do is we have masterclasses, we have conversations, we have a lot of conversations in the Anna newsroom about that, about context, about a deep understanding of African history, um, uh, having those discussions, uh, taking questions, pointing them to uh, the right literature so that they can develop that mindset. I'm going to have each person on the um, on the panel just go around and say if there's one intervention, one intervention that you think could change things. We've got literally a minute. Please just tell us what that is. One sentence. Just go around. How can we actually change this? How do Africans take back the pen? 
greater collaboration across the continent between publishers and editors. Strengthening the local media. It's a, a holistic approach. So it's, you know, working with journalists, editors, owners, you know, government, the whole, the whole system. But I think collectively, even on this panel, we have the resources, we have the infrastructure, talent. It's just working collaboratively to address some of the challenges in the report. I would say, agreeing with Jonathan, strengthening local media, collaboration, and developing powerful networks. Ngugiwa Thiongo was jailed for writing in an African language. Uh, they, therein lies the big problem. That Africans are not are not pride and are not are, are confident in who they are. And Fela Kuti once said, if you can't identify with Africa, then you will not have an identity. We need mm -hmm. to stop complaining and start creating. This has been a really interesting um, conversation. Um, I really want to thank all of you. Thank you to the panelists. Bye.